I like to portray a world without the fall. This is something that Thomas Kincaid said. Uh, let me read that again. I like to portray a world without the fall. Dan Seidel, an art critic, uh, mentioned this comment in a Pathos blog shortly after Kincaid's death in 12, 2012. Um, and Seidel wrote that the Edenic world Kincaid projects is pretty much the fallen world without the dirtiness of the city and the inconvenience of other people. A weekend getaway in the country. All we need to do to return to Eden is get our lives in order. Right? And of course, he's saying that ironically. Right? Uh, and as we know, a return to Eden did not work for Kincaid, who unfortunately died of intoxication um, due to alcohol and Valium. Um, but unfortunately, many Christians' approach to art and literature remains a return to Eden. And I'm going to give an example in writing as well. Uh, the author Sharon Cairns Mann blogged recently that she received guidelines from a publisher who wrote, since we sell the CBA stories, we must follow their rules. And these were the rules that she was given. The stories may not include alcohol consumption by Christian characters, card playing, gambling or games of chance, including raffles, explicit scatological terms, hero and heroine remaining overnight together alone, Halloween celebrations or magic, or the mention of intimate body parts. Lying is also problematical in the CBA market, and characters who are Christian should not lie or deceive others. Possibly there could be exceptional circumstances, matters of life and death, but this has to be okayed by an editor. <laughs> right. And one of man's questions is, who would want to read something like that? <laughs> right. Right. And for her, a major shortcoming of such fiction, and she uses very similar language, is that it fails to take the aesthetic dimension of God's creation, including the fall, seriously. And just so you know, that's not all Christian publishers are quite that rigid, but there definitely is some rigidity for the CBA market. Right. As Christian artists and writers, we either feel restrained or restrain ourselves in ways that God may not be asking of us in our work. Uh, this presentation deals with what does freedom look like for a Christian artist or writer. And I'm going to be focusing on the work of the ethicist Oliver O'Donovan, um, he is a British uh, ethicist, particularly his book, Resurrection and Moral Order, an Outline for Evangelical Ethics. And I'll tell you about my interest in him began because I teach a class at a Christian university, an evangelical university called Writing Theory and Ethics. Um, in this class, I do require, some of you might know this, um, a Care for Words and a Culture of Lies by Marilyn Chandler McIntyre, which is a wonderful book if you are a writer. Uh, care for a word in the culture of lies, but it's definitely more applicational. And I wanted a big picture of ethics, um, but a lot of the Christian ethics books out there are more like, here's a real view that's bad, here's a real view that's bad, here's a real view that's bad, but we got a good one. Um, and I spend the class actually trying to convince the students that they need to engage with ideas and I'm not sure that's the best way to get engaged with ideas because they need to, in my mind, like they need to be challenged. They need to affirm the image of God on these secular theorists and writers. They need to see that God is involved in creation. Um, and that includes people who don't even love God right now. God is involved um, with them. And by having them read that, it's sort of like dismisses everything that we had worked with before because I feel like if they're actually engaging with hard ideas in this way, they're going to know how to engage with the world um, when they leave. And actually, this is like where, man, if you're a thinker, this is where your faith is because this is where you realize this is tough stuff and I need God desperately because sometimes I don't have all the right answers. Um, so I was looking for a book that would do more of that. Unfortunately, it's only a half semester class. And this Oliver O'Donovan is brilliant, but he is really dense to read. And there was no way I could include him. And so I had to come up with a way of summarizing him because what O'Donovan does is he gives you this beautiful moral vision as a believer, this beautiful moral vision that we could fit some of the applications um, that McIntyre was making into. All right. 
So although O'Donovan doesn't write directly to artists and writers, his parents are both short story writers and his two sons are musicians. And he is someone who, I mean, he quotes great pieces of literature all the time. He quotes John Donne especially. He refers to great compositions. Um, he clearly loves art. And so to start us out, what I did is, instead of taking something from his book, I thought, let's talk about a few moral frameworks to kind of just give us a reference for the whole conversation. And he's got a good friend. His name is N.T. Wright. So some of you may be familiar with him. OK, all right. And so I thought, I'm going to take N.T. Wright's frameworks from the book After You Believe, and I'll use those to kind of open us up and get us thinking about this. And then we'll go back, um, we'll go back to O'Donovan. So the first moral framework, number one, uh, I have, and I've renamed these, all right? So Wright calls it moral framework one. I call it dreaming about Eden, okay? So dreaming about Eden. And each of these frameworks has three statements. And I'll read each of those statements twice so that you can kind of just hear it and have a moment to ponder it. So moral framework number one, I call dreaming about Eden. The goal is the final bliss of heaven away from this life of space, time, and matter. So the goal is the final bliss of heaven away from this life of space, time, and matter. The goal is achieved for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus, which we cling to by faith. The goal is achieved for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus, which we cling to by faith. And then the third statement, Christian living in the present consists of anticipating the disembodied internal state through the practice of detached spirituality and the avoidance of worldly contamination. So Christian living in the present consists of anticipating the disembodied eternal state through the practice of a detached spirituality and the avoidance of worldly contamination. That sounds actually a lot like the way I grew up, so, which is why I was trying not to weep when Andrew Peterson was speaking a little bit ago, because I was like, I read those books too. All right, <laughs> so Wright says of this framework, fortunately, there's enough of the genuine gospel in there for people to live by, but those who take that path will be trying to live Christianly with one hand, remember the idea of restraint, one hand tied behind their back. And note that this too is it's inner focused. O'Donovan would call it, quote, a gospel with no concern for life in this world. And it's really, Focus. The framework dreaming about Eden, it echoes Thomas Kincaid and the many readers of evangelical fiction books who don't want to see any mention of sex, alcohol, etc. Okay, the second moral framework, which I call recreating Eden. The goal is to establish God's kingdom on earth by our own hard work. Okay, so the goal is to establish God's kingdom on earth by our own hard work. The goal is demonstrated by Jesus in his public career, starting off the process and showing us how to do it. This goal is demonstrated by Jesus in his public career, starting off the process and showing us how to do it. And then the third statement, Christian living in the present consists of anticipating the final kingdom on earth by working and campaigning for justice, peace, and the alleviation of poverty and distress. So Christian living in the present consists of anticipating the final kingdom on earth by working and campaigning for justice, peace, and the alleviation of poverty and distress. Right, so some good things there, right? Wright says of this framework, here again, there's plenty good news by which people can live, though the heart of the matter seems to be strangely missing, which is perhaps why the attempts to live by this scheme are never as successful as their proponents hope. Of course, all the activities right, are good ones. They are causes we support. Um, but here, if the emphasis, and this is me again, becomes outer focus, it's what O'Donovan calls a concern for a life in this world which has lost the gospel. A concern for life in the world which has lost the gospel. The transformation of the heart may be lost if the external is allowed to overshadow it. Um, though I did have a student, I have this lovely student who's brilliant, who works for me, and she uh, is a major in philosophy, and so I had her read this, and she's like, do you notice, she's like, that's still self-focused, because you're doing it yourself, right? So they're both really self-focused. Um, and the reason I call this Recreating Eden is that we're kind of being like Adam in that our ordering gets off as we hide our sin and focus on something external that was also sin. The woman made me do it, right? So our ordering gets off of it. Um, we may attempt to recreate our own order 
our own structure to how the world should be, right, in Eden without listening to the Spirit. Okay, so there's two major problems with those two frameworks. And I would say that the first is utilitarianism, and I know that many of you know that, and that is art and literature becomes a tool for something else, right? So art and literature has to be done for something else. It has to be, hey, art, great, you can make our worship banner, right? Okay, right? Or art must be for social justice. And these are both valid spheres, right, or themes for art, but they're not the only valid ones. And the second, I would say, is that Christians are kind of playing God by passing over sin, right? Either sin or the effects of sin are treated as if they didn't exist, or the light must overwhelm the darkness. There must always be a good ending to the story for some of you who are writers, right? Um, and so on. Or we are told that despair cannot be left as despair, that we cannot be left encountering art that portrays brokenness, right? right? And so I'll deal with those two problems as I go through the rest of the presentation. But first, moral framework number three. Um, and following O'Donovan, O'Donovan, I'm going to call this um, participating in the created order, because that's really his whole theme, is, is participating. Uh, the goal is a new heaven and new earth, with human beings raised from the dead to be the renewed world's rulers and priests. Right, so again, Wright wrote this, but O'Donovan definitely resonates fully with it. The goal is a new heaven and new earth, with human beings raised from the dead to be renewed world's rulers and priests. This goal is achieved through the kingdom establishing work of Jesus and the Spirit, which we grasp by faith, participate in by baptism, and live out in love. And that word participate is really important, as I just said. Um, and then as you'll see, O'Donovan says, this began at the resurrection and then the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down. So this goal is achieved through the kingdom establishing work of Jesus and the Spirit, which we grasp by faith, participate in by baptism, and live out in love. And then the third statement, Christian living in the present consists of anticipating this ultimate reality through the Spirit-led, habit-forming, truly human practice of faith, hope, and love, sustaining Christians in their calling to worship God and reflect His glory into the world. So Christian living in the present consists of anticipating this ultimate reality through the spirit-led, habit-forming, truly human practice of faith, hope, and love, sustaining Christians in their calling to worship God and reflect his glory into the world. Right. So following this third framework, I'm going to come to my first major point, which is this, and that is that your role as an artist or a writer or a human being is not to return to Eden. That is not your role. According to Oliver O'Donovan as Christians, we've made a mistake in treating redemption as mere restoration. He says that the earth was designed with a telos, an eschatology, um, or a destiny, right, for creation, a destiny for creation. It wasn't created static. It already had a trajectory. Humankind was ordered to flourish. We were set within a created order to flourish. And this concept of created order is central to him. And one of the primary places he goes to to show this from scripture is Psalm 8. So I'll just read that. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then he might say, Amen. <laughs> right? Amen. Well, Donovan points out it's not the human who is supreme here, right? It is the creator. Verse 1 is, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
but humans do have authority. What's really important to acknowledge is that by having an order in creation, we know there is a moral ordering to the world, right? So we know there's a moral ordering to the world, um, which means, by the way, that people who aren't believers can see some of that, right? They can see some of that. At the beginning of creation, Adam was to have authority as one who calls things by their proper names, who has authority or dominion. However, Adam lost his authority in the fall. Humankind was given the law. Naming was done for them through the law. All right? So humankind was given the law, and that's how naming was done. But, O'Donovan says, the possibility of a deeper understanding of the law itself or the situations it addressed was denied. And until, right, the coming of the Holy Spirit after Christ's resurrection. And so the second point then is that your role as an artist and as a writer and as a participant, if you're not an artist or a writer, um, in this creator is to name. We all have, right, the calling to be namers. Many of us as Christian writers and artists have already grasped those words from Genesis 2, right? We're like, especially writers, right? I work with writing majors and they love this idea from Genesis 1. They are namers. But O'Donovan helps us to flesh out this image. With the incarnation, Jesus was born the Son of Man. Creation restored and renewed, is how he says it. He was and is transcendent of the creation's moral order. At the cross, false moral knowledge temporarily won, right? Yay, it was temporary. O'Donovan sees Jesus' resurrection as a climax of God's ongoing narrative and the center of Christian ethics. He calls it God's vindica vindication, very similar to the language of right, right? This is God's vindication of his creation or created order, our created life said, creation is restored and the kingdom dawns. After Pentecost, we now participate fully in the created order, in creation, through the Holy Spirit. And like Adam, like believers are again namers. So what does it mean to name as an artist or writer? Naming is having an impact. O'Donovan writes, the first example of Adam's work that we are given is not digging or sowing, it is naming the beast, giving intelligible order to uncategorized richness of nature. When we work, we use our intelligence to devise and execute purposes. We understand the power and limits of our material. We conceive and deliberate upon the impact we shall make on it. Right? So naming is having an impact. Naming is also truth-telling. Here's another quote from him. Telling the truth is a task entrusted to Adam as he names the animals. It is a responsibility of redeemed humankind which has been told the truth about itself in Jesus. A person, says O'Donovan, has the authority to designate the character of the reality which he encounters, not merely to adhere to certain designations that have already been made for him. As a moral agent, he is involved in deciding what a situation is and demands in the light of the moral order. As a moral agent in history, he has to interpret new situations, plumbing their meanings and declaring them by his decision, which you have to do in all your work. This kind of authority is not a challenge to the authority of God. It is a restoration of Adam's lordship in the natural order, the lordship by which he calls things by their names. And the next, naming is creative and it's imaginative. Naming is creative and imaginative. And this is language that really resonates with artists and writers. Um, repeatedly, O'Donovan describes discernment as creative and making moral decisions as imaginative. And he says, Christian freedom given by the Holy Spirit allows man to make moral responses creatively. Under the law, he was told what the names were but the possibility of a deeper understanding, either of the law itself or the situation addressed, was denied him. Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a possibility of creative discernment, the mind of Christ. And he always qualifies. One of the things I love about O'Donovan is his dependence on the Holy Spirit. His books are just infused with mention of the Holy Spirit. We participate now with what God is doing in the kingdom. 
the spirit forms and brings to expression, and I guess I know this gets really philo philosophical sounding here, the appropriate pattern of free response to objective re reality. So that's naming is creative and imaginative. The next is naming implies being awake. Um, and my writing students, this is so important to them that they are awake. I'm sure many of you have heard that your role as writers and artists is to pay attention, right? To pay attention. O'Donovan describes moral awareness with the metaphor of awakening. And to make moral decisions, we must be able to see the world, to recognize truth. We must be awake, able to attend to our own experience and hear the word or read the word of others. And then the final one, naming well implies loving well. Naming well implies loving well. We cannot do our truth telling in our creative way without love. Love is the effective recognition of a good. A good is recognized as a good in itself and as a good for other things. Um, and note that it's not only the good for other things. We're stepping away from utilitarianism only, right? Love is a fulfillment of the moral law. And then you have to hear how he describes love. He says, love is both wisdom, apprehending creation and its order, which is your role, but also delight, effective attention to something simply for what it is, and the fact that it is. Right? So effective attention to something simply for what it is and the fact that it, it is. Love achieves its creativity by being perceptive, he writes. It attempts to act for any being, and this is so challenging to me, on the basis of an appreciation of that being. It attempts to act for any being on the basis of an appreciation of that being, which to me says, there we need the Holy Spirit because I do not always appreciate my children. So, right? <laughs> All right, so why, why did I cover all of that? Um, so to sum up two things, right? We're called to be truth tellers, all right? Um, we can see that in being people who love, we are not called to be merely utilitarians in our art and our writing. Um, and so you've got that, right? So you've got this idea of calling. You've got this idea of, OK, we're not called to be utilitarians. But it leaves the second problem, which I think is probably the biggest issue right, for many of us here. And that is the, expect the expectation that art does not dwell on sin or the effects of sin. Um, and then we wonder, and that's why this is on freedom, right? We wonder, OK, so what is our freedom here? Am I free to do what I want in acknowledging sin and its effects in my work and acknowledging the darkness of this world. Um, uh, we all know other Christians who would claim that we are not contributing to that ordering by creating what they see as dark. They want to return to England. No, sorry, to England. That would be nice too. All right. <laughs> I am an Anglophile. They want to return to Eden. Neglecting unconsciously the ongoing redemption of this world, which must acknowledge darkness, right? To acknowledge grace, right? We've got to acknowledge darkness if we're going to acknowledge grace. And yet, we all occasionally wonder, right? Like, we wonder, like, where the lines are, right? We wonder in response to the work of another artist or writer if sometimes a boundary has been crossed. And I was trying to think, okay, so when has that happened to me? And I guess. This is a really personal story, but it was one where it really hit me hard. It was about five or six years ago. Um, so I'm from Minneapolis, St. Paul. I love Minneapolis, St. Paul. I love the culture there. And uh, Jonathan Franzen wrote a book called Freedom. It's like this thick, by the way. <laughs> All right? It's like this thick. Um, that's about Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. It's a fictional book. It's critically acclaimed. And I thought, I have to read this book. All right? So I have to read this book. And I start to read it, and it's full of sex scenes, like loads of sex scenes. And I'm not a person, actually, who's like, I think that as long as there's not lower details, sometimes a scene like that can actually help the character develop, because that's what happens in real life, right? All right, sex is part of our story. It can maybe move the story along. But it was packed with them, and it began to feel gratuitous to me. And as a Christian, like who's in a monogamous relationship, right, with my husband, I was just like, 
actually, I don't need to be comparing myself constantly to what's going on in this book. And my husband's like, well, why are you reading it, right? He had an easy response, but I had this like, but this is like this critically acclaimed book. I should, right? I should uh, read it. Um, and in the end, I decided he was right. I was like, I, I'm not going to do this. And maybe that's my sensitivity. I knew other people who seemed comfortable with reading it, so maybe it was my sensitivity. And I do have to say I felt really justified because I skimmed to the end of it because I was like, okay, is this worth going through all this? And it ends up that the liberal St. Paul characters are nuanced and the conservative are not. And I was like, all right, I know both lovely liberals and conservatives in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and they're all nuanced, so I'm done. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> All right, but it's hard to know right where the line is, and this is something that O'Donovan's going to do. Is like he is not going to tell anybody exactly where the line is, as you'll see in a moment. But it's a really wonderful thing because that's where our relationship with God is, because in our dependence. Okay, so is there a line to be drawn as a Christian when making such choices in our artistic creation? If there is a line. Right, then there are two questions, right? Then like, so what is, like, what are the lines? And then what is freedom? We have to talk about what freedom is. So my third point is what freedom is. So first I'll cover what freedom is not, right? Um, freedom in Christ is not doing whatever we want, right? It's not doing whatever we want. Um, and in fact, O'Donovan says that if you believe that your role is to, like, bring order to chaos, He's like, you've got a problem. Because first of all, there already is a created order that exists. And he's like, your dominion, like as a namer, right, from Adam's lineage, your dominion is going to become domination. Which but I thought, that's fascinating. I would like to just spend lots more time on that, but not today. <laughs> anyway, but your dominion will become dom dom domination. So you don't get to do whatever you want. That is not freedom. And yet, freedom is not requiring of ourselves a multitude of specific rules. It's not, which is kind of how I was raised. Maybe some of you were too. O'Donovan sees moral law as generic and not specific. He says in Moral Knowledge that we have an outline, and I love that word, and that's probably why he used it, right, in the cover, and that as time goes on, we begin to see the color and nuances within that outline. And while we're doing that, we're delighting in God's created order. Um, we do have special revelation, right, as a major way of disclosing God's moral law, right? Scripture is authoritative. But it's not that we add to a moral code, but that it gets deeper and more complex. If we do have a simplistic understanding of a moral code, and we add lots of little applications to it, we will get to the point that we just start to obey what we want, right? Because there will always be an exception, right? There will always be an exception. And we'll get to the point that we'll just start obeying what we want um, and then kind of compartmentalizing and not <laughs> right, obeying the rest. What freedom is, is freedom is participation in Christ's authority within the created order. The authority by virtue of which, according to St. Paul, we are no longer slaves, and this is his quote, but we are sons. We are no longer slaves, but sons. So freedom is participation in Christ's authority within the created order. We are participants. And he says that emancipation, because if you think of that moment, especially at conversion, if you've had a conversion experience, you just feel free. Um, you feel such freedom. You're like, that's only one moment. That's only one moment. That really freedom opens the way to a fulfilling self-government. We are no longer oppressed by the law because we are no longer confused by it. Because through the Holy Spirit, and that includes the voice of the church, and that includes reading scripture, we're beginning to see the law well for the first time. He writes that it is the mark of true freedom that it can see the moral law from a new vantage point, a witness to God's purpose to order and bless the life of the human race which is such a different way, right? To think we often think of law, we think bad, right? Like, oh, it's, I'm restrained. But he's like, instead, it's a mark of true freedom that it can see the moral law from a new vantage point, a witness to God's purpose in order to order and bless the life of the human race. What previously looked like disconnected arbitrary norms comes together in a coherent law of Christ, the love of neighbor as self. So how do we know that we're taking the right action? And to follow O'Donovan here, I have to become what generic, right? So we love God, right? 
In Matthew 22, the lawyer attempts to test Jesus by asking him a question. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So in this love command is right. It's echoing scripture from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And O'Donovan is one of those believers who believe that all that that basically that love command like includes all the rest, all the rest of scripture. There is no competition, he says, between our love for God and our love of neighbor, which when I grew up, that was a challenge too, right? Um, it felt like there was a competition between our love for God and our love of neighbor. Out of primary love for God comes secondary love of neighbor. Out of primary love for God comes our secondary love of neighbor. And this is, by the way, Augustine, right? Thought right there. If we love God and neighbor, our other loves become rightly ordered. So in moral, like as we're thinking about our work and if we wonder, is this okay to do? This is what the love of God looks like. We read scripture, but we don't read it searching for a verse. And we don't read it making a list of what behavior is okay to do. We don't do that. Um, he writes, we will read the Bible seriously only when it, when we, let's, oops, oops, we use it, sorry, when we use it to guide our thought toward a comprehensive moral viewpoint and not merely to articulate disconnected moral claims. We must look within it not only for moral bricks, but for the indications of the order in which the bricks belong together. He also implies that we read and thus interpret it within the body of believers. In fact, in his mind, the most important event of a worship service is the reading of scripture because it authorizes all the rest. <laughs> right. Right. Besides reading scripture, again, this is pretty basic, right? We pray. Um, and he is really about prayer. <laughs> in his work, O'Donovan quotes prayer a lot. He quotes the Lord's Prayer. He spends lots of time in his last three books just dwelling on the Lord's Prayer. He quotes liturgical prayers. He quotes the prayers of John Donne. He says that at the heart of moral thinking is a prayer for the coming of God to reshape our freedom with, from within. And then he quotes Dunn saying, come and recreate me now grown ruinous. Come and recreate me now grown ruinous. Um, one thing that, let's see, I really like is he says, we pray for the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit, illuminating the form of the world and its destiny. We we pray for the presence and work of the Holy Spirit, illuminating the form of the world and its destiny. And that means, by the way, that prayer has to include confession and it has to include praise. And some of it needs to be collective. Right. And so I'm going to walk you just quickly through the Lord's Prayer with him since it's so important to his thought. Right. So, And this is from the Book of Common Prayer. That's where I took it out of. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So Donovan says here, God is the creator. This reminds us that God is the creator of the moral order. We give glory to him, but we still get to call him Father because now we have gained that authority, right? To be namers like Adam. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, this is our moral vision. Okay, our now and not yet of the kingdom. We participate in his will, what he's already doing. And we know that he has this world on a trajectory that we're part of. Give us this day our daily bread. So even in our work that we're participating in, we're still dependent and we need him just, and that's hard sometimes to think in the U.S., but even for our sustenance. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, one of the things he says is we have to have a careful narration of our sins and our confession, which is kind of hard for me, and I've been really challenged by this. Um, but he says that's important to God. Um, and one of the reasons why is that he says that judgment of self and judgment of others, which were so easy to do. I was just talking last night to a friend that in the world of social media, all we do is judge anymore, right? 
All we do is judge and write people off and enjoy sounding really smart by sounding really snarky. <laughs> okay? <laughs> by being really snarky. Um, and, he, and he says that we have to see our judgment of our own selves. Like, so there's a lot of grace in this as provisional as far as it's open-handed. Like we're going to add knowledge to it, right? And, and others. He even says, and this is kind of shocking to me, um, we can't even judge people who have already died because he uses the word disclosed because God hasn't disclosed to us what happened in the last moments of their lives. And we need to be really careful about judging other Christians or people we don't know whether they claim faith or not because we don't know what God's doing in them. That hasn't been disclosed to us. That's sort of God's secret. We have other revelation, but God hasn't disclosed that. Um, so it, sort of, it forces us to have a grace for others in our work, but also to have a grace for ourselves. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so the prayer ends on, again, God's, right, God's order that we are participating in. Amen. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So other ways we talk with others, you know this, but it's really important to him when he says that we talk to others, that we only choose one or two wise people because we're just going to spread ourselves too thin, and that these people are so wise to us that they probably don't directly tell us what to do. So if you are at a place where you're doing something, um, one of my former students um, did include um, sort of a, a really subdued sexual scene in a YA novel that she wrote, and it was a big deal in her writer's group going back and forth. Do I need this? Do I need this? Um, and she, they, the other writers, like, sort of like, well, it could be encouraging to the story, but basically what he says is have someone who helps you to consider the moral choice, but not necessarily always like, do this, okay? Helps you to wisely consider. Like, they lead you in a good consideration of it. We obey our authorities as long as they are not asking us to do something wrong. So that's another piece there. We obey our authorities as long as they are not asking us to do something wrong. So if you do submit your work, right, to a juried art show, you have to follow, right, their guidelines. And the same with if you want Christian pub, you know, right, you want to submit your work to a Christian publisher, right, you have to follow their guidelines. And what O'Donovan says, what this looks like is they cannot tell you to do something bad, but the way the world works and the government works, they can tell you to withdraw the good, which is hard, but that is part of being under authority. Um, but then finally, I would also say um, is that we delight, that when it comes to like making decisions that are hard, like my former student did, that we're actually, instead of being in this place of agonizing, we're supposed to be in a place of delighting. And this delight looks like praise and joy and hope, right? Remember that he describes love as both wisdom. We see, like, right, you can look outside right there and see God's moral order, right? He has ordered creation in this beautiful way, right? And it's funny, you can look either direction when you're in Colorado Springs, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so um, it's gorgeous, right? Um, so we apprehend, but we also remember that love is the effective attention to something simply for what it is and for the fact that it is. And again, I think that's something that separates artists and writers. Like, like sometimes don't you just like look at like a brick in the wall and you're like, wow, look at those lines. Look at that texture, right? That, that is who you are. And yet it's just a brick, but you're appreciating, you're appreciating it. So rather than agonize over a hard choice, we should delight in the manifoldness of God's created order. And when he writes about this, he um, quotes Psalm 119. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. <laughs> right? We see God's steadfast love. Our responsibility as moral beings is what he calls a glad responsibility. Okay, but I have to go back to the second problem, because the second problem is what do we do about that expectation that as Christian artists we're not going to spend time on sin or on the effects of sin. So, if an artist dwells in darkness, does he or she show an overcoming by light so that there is, the, like, the, must he or she do that? Show uh, um, an overcoming by light so that there is a full, a full history of redemption displayed, which I have heard before, right? Like, you have got to sort of, like, almost give the whole gospel in what you're doing, <laughs> all right? Okay, 
Uh, and then what about if you're not a writer, but that you do visual representation? Um, and like, can you do an isolated incident of darkness? Would that be, right? Is that OK to do? All right. And so some things that have really helped me as I've read a Donovan is that he's reminded us that we are limited human beings, right? We're limited human beings as far as our knowledge and our judgments are provisional. We're holding it out to God open-handed, and God will add to it. But sometimes he'll say, actually, you know what? You, as you're getting older and maturing, um, you were actually really uptight about that. You know what I mean? Or you're wrong on this or that kind of thing, right? So we're holding it out um, to God. Uh, again, remember the idea of we get to see an outline, but those details are being filled in with us as we mature. All right? And then something else he says that helps me is he says, we don't know the future. We don't know the future. Um, we know the absolute future, right? We know that Jesus will return someday and we'll get to celebrate and that God will have his judgment. And O'Donovan uses the language and he's going to say yes to your works, all right? He's going to say yes um, to what you've been doing as you participated um, in his glory, right? We don't for sure know the future. We don't get to transcend time. And then the third thing, and I'll tell you why these are important. We are limited as human beings. We don't know the future. And we are, that we are in dialogue. He actually says that all your work, whether you're an artist or a writer or not, is communication. You are communicating. Work is communication with other beings. He quote, a quote from him, our communication with other beings through work determines the complex patterns of human society itself. And isn't that what we're always thinking about art and writing? We want it to build culture, right? We want it to build culture. Uh, he says that Christian freedom, again quoting, is grounded in communication. It is discursively engaged, not only with other agents, but in dialogical intimacy with God himself, who speaks with those who possess the spirit as he did with Moses face to face, that we are in diet with dialogue with God face to face, led by the spirit and walking in the spirit, they find their human purposes shaped responsibly to his purpose. Okay, so if we are limited and we only know and judge in this open-handed way, and we cannot control on time. We can't control time. We can't say exactly what God is going to do right in the future. Um, and we are in dialogue all the time with our work and others um, and with God. I mean, I think what he's really doing there is he's showing that we are in the process within this ongoing narrative, right? We have the beginning of Genesis, and then you take scripture, and it doesn't end with Revelation. It keeps going. We're in that part. Like if you've read the idea of the five dramas that N.T. right? we're still in that part where it's still ongoing, the story that God is telling. Um, and yet, just as you know, sorry, I keep talking about writers, can my writer, like, you know how a character just can kind of like come up with its own personality, that kind of thing? Like there's this process that's happening, right? There's a process that's, that's happening. Um, and what that means is that I think that we get to be in process, right? We get to be in process. So I am sure there are things, oh, actually, I know there are things that I wrote, especially as a college student, that I'm embarrassed by now. And do you know what I mean? And there's even things I would say was probably inappropriate to say. Um, mm -hmm. But we get to be in process. But really what's, what it means is that we're in this place of dependency, right? This place on dependency where we're listening and we just have to trust that we're taking the right step. All right. So, but I should conclude, though. I should conclude, though, with this idea. Um, wow, and I had no idea I could speak that long. OK. <laughs> I usually run workshops, so I thought, this isn't long enough, but I'm OK. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, all right. So, and that is. <laughs> If you have integrity in your freedom in God as an artist and a writer, you will suffer exclusion sometimes. You will be excluded. And it might be that you are being excluded by Christians that you know and you love, right? Or it might be that you are being excluded by a, you know, secular people who laugh at some of your themes. I mean, it could go, right? It could go either way. You will be excluded. And according to O'Donovan, this is the path to full participation. 
it lies in being excluded. This is what it means to imitate Christ. This is what it means to take up the cross. Because of our faith, we give up goods that we had access to to be shaped more like Jesus. We, have, we end up sacrificing to be shaped more like Jesus. So you might have freedom in Christ to enter, right? To enter a juried art um, show and then decide, actually, I can't follow along with some of the things that's going on here. And you will feel, right? You'll feel excluded and you won't have that moment you wanted where someone might recognize your work. And so that leaves us then with like just looking forward to that future moment where God will say yes over our work. <coughs> right. So I'm just going to end by praying the Lord's Prayer because it's so precious to him. And I wasn't, I didn't, I had no idea Andrew Peterson was going to pray <laughs> downstairs. So, but it feels like the right way to end. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right, and I pray that for each of you. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. So. Okay. <laughs>